use the KIM database for storing that information, and that's fine. Uh, but um, you certainly wouldn't want to do that for a large institution. The maintenance uh, of that would just be uh, horrendous. So integration with LDAP is, is, is not difficult. We've done it at two uh, of the, um, the, the production schools so far. Um, definitely a lot of help from uh, U of A with the coding uh, related to that. And what we actually, again, this is configured through Spring, and what we had to do is override the person and entity service. Um, each one of those has about um, a half a dozen methods um, in the, the default uh, uh, out-of-the-box solution. Those methods end up making database calls. All we had to do is change them to call LDAP instead. And uh, something that made that actually very simple is uh, there's another open source project that takes advantage of Spring to wire up all those LDAP uh, calls. So the actual work we had to do, the, the amount of Java code was surprisingly small. It, it was really just creating a, a mapping uh, using Spring that says, okay, for, the, for this uh, field uh, in Kim, what is the associated data point in your, your LDAP system? Uh, so that's really made it uh, great, especially going from implementing school to, you know, from one to the other. Um, there's often differences in how, you know, how LDAP is set up. So just by you know, a fairly simple configuration uh, mapping file, you can change that. So that code is, uh, is available uh, for anyone who would like to take advantage of it. It is not part of, uh, of uh, RICE uh, 1.0 at, at this point. Um, one of the things that we have not done yet is override the group service. So the group service, service if you remember, it, you know, is how to group users together uh, instead of assigning them directly to roles. Some universities have systems uh, already for doing that, much like LDAP, but for groups, um, uh, whether it's Grouper, grouper or, or others. Um, so again, in order to implement that, uh, we would just override the group service um, and have it point to uh, you know, your system. That would, that would be a little bit of uh, you know, more work. LDAP, I think, is a little bit more... Uh, yeah, kind of defined, and it, you know, it's it's a finite number of things you can do with it. Um, grouper would be a little more work because you would have to uh, replicate uh, a lot of the data that's already used in in the system onto your your group uh, your system. Uh, and the same thing could actually be true of, of roles. So if you've already got people defined in roles in an external system. Uh, and you wanted to, you know, pull that data into Kim, that would be, you know, uh, not as, as trivial as LDAP, but it is certainly possible. Again, that's really what it's, def uh, you know, designed to do. Um, I think there was, uh, as part of the LDAP customization, there was actually uh, uh, one or two other uh, services uh, that had to have uh, pretty trivial modifications to them. Um, and, uh, but again, uh, if you want to use that at your campus, I think you'll find the process is, uh, it, it, it is pretty simple. Uh, a couple uh, choices that have to be made when you, when you use LDAP, um, uh, one of them is system users. So, and this is, these are really system entities. Like we talked about in the entity table, that can be your users or that can be uh, other entities in uh, the system. So for, like, for example, there's two that, that come with KFS. There's the KR user that represents uh, the RICE, and then there's the KF user that represents the financial system. So again, just to remind you, that's for you know, when the system is doing things behind the scene and it needs to check permissions for what the system is allowed to use, it has to look up those users. So there's two ways you can handle that. One is to just create those, uh, those users in your LDAP system. So, um, you know, that, that would mean you just kind of have two dummy users in, in LDAP that, that represent these. Um, that's, uh, you know, not always the best way to go. I mean, it kind of uh, um, confuses the data a little bit. So you've got, you know, some, some non-users in your LDAP. Uh, for some schools, that might just be the, the quicker way to do it. How, how other schools have done it is actually um, customize the, uh, the person uh, and entity service to actually understand that some data is going to be in LDAP, some of it's going to be um, actually still in the database. So, for example, at U of A, uh, they, they're integrating uh, with LDAP, but have the, those two system users still in the database. And the customized person and entity service uh, 
know that if they don't find it in LDAP, uh, to go look in the database. Um, I think that's a, a pretty good solution just because it, it separates out um, uh, where the users are at. There's a, you know, a very slight performance hit related to it, but it, you know, that's because of it, it's doing an extra LDAP lookup for users that maybe it shouldn't have to. Um, but uh, you know it works well, and uh, you know because of caching and other things uh, the, uh, of the LDAP data, the performance hit should be pretty trivial. Mm -hmm. And we already talked about the IDs in, in the implementation. Uh, that's just again of whether you want to allow it to use generated IDs, uh, or uh, you know this is uh, or or um, you know take advantage of the student ID. Again, that's that's a choice that's up to you. The pros and cons, you know, make it uh, pretty equal. Um, Another real value of KIM um, is how it can unify your identity management across campus. So it's not just something that can be you know, you know, used for KFS or your one-off applications. It can really become the central uh, hub for providing data to any of your systems. So whether you know, it certainly is very simple to use if you're taking advantage of, of all of RICE, uh, using workflow, using the nervous system. Um, it makes your job really easy then. But even if you're not using the nervous system, if you've got an external system that you want to tie into KIM, uh, you can do that. Um, most of the time that will be done through web services. Um, for those, uh, another piece of rice that some of you might be familiar with is the KSV, the, the Quality Service Bus. Um, that's what you would use from your external system to request uh, you know, and exchange information with KIM. That can be done, you know, straight through Java if it's a Java application, or web services if it's, uh, you know, a LAMP stack. Um, it's really flexible in how that works, and uh, it's definitely a great way uh, to kind of centralize that data uh, and centralize the, the the services so that you don't have to have multiple services, uh, multiple applications talking, you know, individually uh, to to you know, or having their own data. It can all be stored in one place. Um, and another uh, way to look at it, if you already have an identity management solution on campus, um, Kim can really just become a, uh, a, a very lightweight layer on top of your already implemented identity management service. So a lot of uh, IDMs uh, uh, that, that some schools use are you know, really um, overkill for a lot of situations and don't provide some of the tools that Kim and the nervous system and, and workflow do. So if, if uh, Kim becomes a front end to your, your, the IDM you already have, it just makes development and, and management of, of your, uh, your RICE-based applications much simpler. Uh, a, a few other uh, things to think about. Um, if you're going to become, if you plan on doing your own development um, using RICE um, or Kim, you really need to, to become a RICE developer. Um, I, I'm not talking about just doing, you know, management of the system. You know, that, that's different. If, if you're just going to take advantage of the access security module, things like that, you don't need to be a developer for that. Um, but most, most schools getting into the system end up, you know, wanting to do their own applications. So learning to be a Rice developer is important. Uh, you can take advantage of the community for that. There's, there's lots of ways to get trained, but I, I highly recommend, you know, looking into training for that. Because learning it on your own can, can be a, a real challenge, just because there are so many different uh, aspects to it, um, and it is such a flexible system that with flexibility be, you know, comes a little bit of uh, complexity as well. And of course, as many of you already know, the community support uh, for any of the, the applications, whether it's RICE or KFS or the, the sub-modules like KIM, uh, the community is just, uh, has been awesome as a tool for, for helping uh, schools that are, uh, that are implementing. Um, there, are, there are several uh, employees of the foundation um, that are, uh, you know, that are they're there all the time. Whether it's, uh, you know, people like Eric Westfall or Tom Bradford, they've been uh, great in uh, providing support. But just regular community members who, you know, have full-time jobs already have been wonderful in, in helping to uh, support uh, implementing schools or just people trying to to learn about Kim and, and Rice, just getting it up and running, whatever uh, you want. And I'd highly recommend that if you, you start thinking seriously about becoming, uh, you know, getting involved with, with Kim, that you consider becoming a, a community member. Um, you, know, more, you know, certainly if you just want to uh, download the software and use it and ask for help, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get great support. But um, if you want to actually contribute, uh, whether it's resources or advice or, or